All right, uh, we're studying First Peter. Real quickly, uh, where we are in that in that enterprise. Peter is written to Gentile Christians. They're in Asia Minor, probably uh, Christians that Peter hadn't personally evangelized. And these Christians, they're experiencing uh, difficulties, probably some kind of local unofficial persecution. That's not hard to understand when you have a society and culture that resents Christianity, as was true in large swaths of the Roman Empire. Uh, they're, they're getting, you know, probably mocked and criticized, uh, maybe dragged into court on trumped up charges. Being a Christian there is not easy. And I think that's an important message for the church today, always, that uh, we need encouragement to hold firm to the confession of faith in difficult times. In difficult times when, uh, when there's pressure and you want, you're tempted to step away because it would be easier in your judgment to do that. So he's, he's writing to them to encourage them to endure in the face of their difficulties. He greets them in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then in verses 3 through 9, he speaks to them of the blessings of salvation. And you can see what that would mean is if, if somebody's being tempted to turn loose of Christ or to uh, deny their confession or to back away, you hold before them and say, listen to what is in store for you. He paints the, the greatness of their salvation. There is in store for them an eternal, precious and constant inheritance that they will receive when Christ returns to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming. And their reaction on that day will be one of just unparalleled rejoicing, like the celebration to end all celebrations, the joy that just comes out. And I look forward to that uh, more than you know. Verses 10 through 12, he emphasizes that he shows them the greatness of the blessing, tells them the blessing of salvation. And in verses 10 through 12, he emphasizes or highlights that the greatness of that salvation by noting that the Old Testament prophets, they were taken by its glory and that even angels long to explore the depths of that salvation. So this is really a significant, tremendous thing that you're risking turning loose if you succumb to the pressure of the culture and the society that's tempting you to say, "Ah, I don't really want to hang on to Christ. Verses 13 to 16, he calls them in light of the greatness of the salvation with which the holy God has blessed them. He calls them in light of that to live holy lives, to be holy in all their conduct. Because God is holy, he is morally and ethically distinct. He calls those he has blessed with salvation to live holy lives, to be morally and ethically distinct from the world. This is not some optional thing. We are called to that as Christians, to live holy lives, to be holy in all our conduct. Verses 17 to 21 of chapter 1, he he motivates them to holy living by by telling them they need to have a sober awareness of the dreadful consequences of defying God. This is this idea of fearing God. They need to understand that to reject God, to defy God, carries tremendous consequences. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I said last week that doesn't mean chewing your fingernails and and lacking a sense of intimacy with God. It means having an awareness that if I choose to stick my thumb in God's eye, that there will be problems. You see, just like with a parent, you know, your parent, you love your parent, they're as close as, but if you wind up, welcome, spit on your mom, I hope you understand that, you know, there's going to be some consequences. And so it's that kind of idea. There has to be this sense of fear and he motivates them to holy living by telling them that, but also he does it by reminding them of the breathtaking price that was paid for their redemption. Not just to tell them, listen, you need to, you need to have this fear of God and understand that. But you need to understand that your redemption, your salvation was purchased with the supremely precious blood, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't get any greater than that, doesn't get any uh, grander than that. And so he motivates in that to see, understand the price that was paid for your salvation. It was purchased with that life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter uh, 1, 22 to 25, he calls him to love as those who've been reborn through the word of God. And we had just started looking at that last week. Chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. He says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, resulting in genuine brotherly love, 
Love one another fervently from a pure heart, having been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached as good news to you. So Peter here, he says that they had purified themselves by obedience to the truth. Meaning they had embraced the gospel. They had obeyed the gospel. They had accepted it. The message had come to them and they had said, yes, I am embracing that, which includes their submission in baptism. You see, in fact, it's alluded to in this idea of having purified. And I read you the quote from Peter David's last week. That's an allusion to Old Testament washings in cultic context. But you see in chapter three, verse 21, very clearly uh, how Peter understands the importance of salvation. I mean, of baptism as part of the acceptance of this message. But he says he tells them that they purified themselves by obedience to the truth and their conversion resulted in their having a genuine love for fellow Christians. OK, their conversion, their their becoming Christians resulted in their having a genuine love for fellow Christians. Their passage from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light It brought them into a special relationship. It brought them into fellowship with all others who had made that same journey. All others who had been rescued. All others who were lost, drowning at sea, who had been rescued by the Lord. It brought them into this bond with them. Why? Because we are all the people who have been rescued. I didn't do anything great. I didn't do anything grand. We were all lost. In a dire situation, and what happened? We were all fished out. We were all saved. So you see, that brings me in necessarily into a relationship with you. And so this idea, being born into, uh, born again, becoming a Christian, this conversion, it brings us into a special relationship with all people. Conversion, becoming a Christian, it includes entrance into the brotherhood of the redeemed, into the church of Christ. Christianity is not this thing where I am reborn alone and I'm not born into a redeemed community. I, I'm not the only one. I have been saved by Christ, rescued, but so have all these other people. Do you see? So I am born in this conversion. It brings me into entrance or it, it, I enter into the brotherhood of the redeemed. And it includes love, loving other Christians simply because they are fellow Christians. Because they have been rescued, because they have redeemed, been redeemed. As I have been, so have they been. So there is a loving relationship that flows out of our mutual rescue. But that's a fact. They have been born into that. But then Peter, Peter commands them to deepen and intensify that love. They are to love one another fervently from a pure heart. Okay, meaning a heart that's not that's untainted by ulterior motives. So, yes, we have been born into this. It is a consequence of our birth that we share a bond with all others who've been who have likewise been rescued. But that doesn't mean we don't have a role to play where he says, therefore, you go ahead and you love one another fervently. You love one another fervently with an untainted heart, no ulterior motives, a pure heart. And see, we are to be intensely committed To the welfare, the blessing, the best interest of brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it means to love people. You understand that as a parent. You're not always with your child, especially when they get in those teen years. You're not always sitting here going, oh, my baby, she's so wonderful. You're not always doing that. There's sometimes conflict there, but you always love them. Now, why is that? Because you always are devoted to their welfare. You have their best interest at heart. You would, if you're a normal, healthy parent, die for them. Right? So even though you're you're disciplined, doing these other things, there is this commitment. That's what he's saying that we are to have in the church. We have to be intensely committed to the welfare, to the blessing, to the best interest of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We want what's best for them. We want goodness for them. And we are committed to that, and he urges us to do that, not because we're working some angle, not because we've got some ulterior motive and we see that, listen, 
okay, if I do this, I think I can work this into my advantage. This will come to me. Not because of that. There is no ulterior motive. It's from a pure heart. It's because they are fellow heirs of God's gracious gift of life. That is why he says, listen, you're to love one another fervently from a pure heart. The Bible is full of these kinds of things. And you wonder, you know, we grab on to some things, other things we don't grab on to. Other things, it just seems that they, yeah, yeah, I, I, I read those words, but I don't really care about that. But here it is sitting right there and in many other places. The instrument of their new birth, he says, it wasn't an earthly perishable seed like the sperm of a human father, but the heavenly imperishable seed of the word of God, which seed quite naturally gives birth to imperishable life, as he referred to in chapter 1, verse 4. So they've been born of this imperishable seed, the word of God. Everything in this fallen world will, in its fallen state, as it is presently constituted, it will perish, but the word of the Lord will not. It has no expiration date. It will remain true. It will remain valid throughout eternity. It doesn't matter what society says, what culture says, what time says. That word stands like an absolute rock, and it's the truth. It is the word of God revealed to mankind, and it stands. People rail against it. People blow hard against it. It just sits there like a rock. And he says, see, there is no expiration date on the word of God. That truth will stand valid throughout eternity. And he tells them, and that's the word that was preached to them in the gospel of Christ. The word that gave them new life. What message did you have? It's the word of God. It is the permanent, eternal, forever standing word of God that came to you in this message about what he's done in Jesus Christ. You embraced it and you've been given new life through that. He wants them to see it. He wants them to understand it. He wants them to know it. And then he says in chapter 2, 1 through 3, he says, Therefore, put away all malice and all deceit and forms of hypocrisy and envy and all acts of slander. I put forms of hypocrisy and acts of slander because those two nouns are plural. And it just seems that's what he's driving at, hypocrisies and slanders. Okay, as newborn babies crave the pure rational milk in order that by it you may grow up into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, given the need for Christians to love one another fervently in light of their common birth into a new life through the word of God. That's why he says, therefore, given that need of them to love one another fervently in light of that new birth through the word of, word of the Lord. He commands them to put away what? Put away all malice and all deceit. And forms of hypocrisy and envy and all acts of slander. There's no place for any of this in relationships within the body of Christ. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, I've been in churches, uh, you know, and I've paid attention. And it seems like this happens. I know. (laughs) And it shouldn't. Right? It, It shouldn't, right? Malice, these kinds of things, they shouldn't be there. The Spirit of God is telling us as plain as day, just completely, you know, blatantly just telling us that these things are not supposed to be there. They're not to be part of that, not to be we're not to be involved in that. But yet here we are. uh, You see that we wind up we wind up being in that situation and in that circumstance. We wind up there with malice. Okay, Schreiner, Schreiner comments, he says, the sins listed tear at the social fabric of the church, ripping away the threads of love that keep them together. Can't you see that? Right? I mean, malice in, or ill will is the opposite of love. What does malice want? Love is this commitment to another's welfare, to another's blessing, to the best for another person. What is malice? It's the opposite of it. I want bad for you. I want something to happen to you. I have that evil eye on you. Well, is that love? No, it's the opposite of love. You may mask it and all that kind of stuff, but if you really are after somebody and, you know, you want something bad for them, yeah, that's good. Some Something befall, oh, that's good, I like it. You never say it, maybe. But down in there in that heart, you see that dark, ugly stuff. Malice is no place for that in the church. Deceit or guile and hypocrisy. You see that he mentions here, 
being a phony. That's the word. See, being a phony, either deceit or hypocrisy is putting on a mask, pretending to be something you're not. Those things undermine trust, and they make it very difficult for love to flourish in a community of people. If I have to wonder if you're running a game on me, you see, you, if you've ever been in a, I'm sure Terry can tell many stories, people call all the time, or they visit, and they're always sitting there, and you just wish, like, you know, pray to God that I could understand if this person's running a game on me. Because if he is, it's not loving to help the person. So you see what winds up happening, how, how detrimental this is to the flourishing of love in a community. I then, now I have to wonder about this. I have to wonder, what does love demand of me in this circumstance? And it, it takes away my compassion for the person. So if we're doing this in the body of Christ, I'm coming over here and just, you know, I'm fronting, I'm, you know, I'm being a phony. And you get people thinking, that, well, I just don't know. If we would be open, transparent, so people know. Listen, this is somebody who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he's telling me this, I know that's the truth. What well, do you see? That would be like, you know, just go, that, that would just go through the congregation. It would be a blessing to the congregation. So he mentions malice, he mentions deceit or guile and hypocrisy. Envy is a resentment over and a desire to have something that belongs to another, it travels in this, in the circ, in this circle of being, of coveting. You see what that does to a congregation, right? If somebody's envious, well, you know, this person's doing this, or this person that, this person this. I really, I, I'm resentful of that. I don't like that. Well, what does that do? Those are barriers. See, you know, Christianity, the Word of God, gets down to where we live. You see, it's where we live, deep stuff. But it's the deep stuff that we tend to ward off and say, yeah, okay, I read that. I read that. But what the Spirit of God wants is for us to be transformed by reading that. So that we then say, ooh, is that me? Is that me doing that? Our tendency is to say, oh, that's Ashby doing that. Okay? You have to sit here and say, look, does this work to me? Slander is verbally running somebody down, saying things intended to lower them in another person's eyes. What does that do for a community of people? Well, it's terrible, right? You're sitting there coming up here. Do you know about, uh, oh, man, did you hear what, uh, you hear this, you hear that? And what happens then? It just creates these pockets of, you know, groups who have certain perceptions of people. And then pocket over here, pocket over here. Yeah. It's bad. It's bad. But yet it goes on. It goes on. And we just, okay, well, that's okay. Um, I think it wouldn't go on so much. If when that kind of thing's happening, there was no ear for it. And somebody said, I really don't think that's appropriate for you to talk that way. Ooh-ooh. You see, if, I, if I'm slandering people or gossiping, I'm getting an audience. If I didn't get an audience, I think it would dry up. At least significantly would be retarded. Okay, as newborn babes, they crave the milk of their mothers. Everybody knows that. As babies crave the milk of their mothers, they are to crave the pure, uncontaminated, rational milk that is the word of God so that by it they may mature as Christians. Let me read to you what the Thomas Schreiner says in his commentary on first and his comment on first Peter, but his commentary is on first and second Peter and Jude. He says the word logikos is translated by the NIV and understood by many to mean spiritual. So when I read that as rational, some of you were probably going, well, what's this about? Okay, so it says, usually, however, in Greek literature, the term refers to that which is rational or reasonable. It is not equated with the term spiritual, even though it overlaps with it. Peter probably opted for the term to clarify that the milk he had in view was the word of God. The word logos, after all, was the means by which God begot believers. God's word, rhema abides forever, and that very word is identified as the gospel preached to the Petrine believers, chapter 1, verse 25. Hence, Peter used logikos to define milk here, so that the readers will understand that the milk by which they grow is nothing other than the word of God. The means by which God sanctifies believers is through the mind, through the continued Proclamation of the word spiritual growth is not primarily mystical, but rational in the sense that it is informed and sustained by God's word. Okay, we have to understand that 
the gateway. I'm, you know, I'm all for uh, spiritual transformation, but we have to understand that is tied. The gateway to that transformation is the mind through the word of God. The word comes in and we are transformed. That's why I left it that way is rational milk, because I wanted to see the point that there is this sense of we are, you know, we have this idea sometimes of, well, you don't want to be really too reasonable, rational, too thinking. You just want, kind of want to just hang out. You know, just hang out. Okay? Look, the heart and the mind go together. I understand that. Okay? The heart and the mind go together. But don't downplay the mind as though it's sub-Christian or sub-spiritual or something like that. Oh, that's just, you know, thinking. Yeah, it is thinking. Why do you think this was written? He's speaking to what? He's speaking to a mind. Right? He's through the mind. I'm absorbing this and reading it. Okay. I see. I see. Okay, so that, I think that's an important uh, thing to understand. Now, this, uh, this growing up or maturing as Christians is into salvation. It is into salvation in that, in that the growth process begun with the new birth It culminates in eschatological salvation. It culminates in our participation, ultimately, in that salvation he's already talked about. Our participation in the consummated kingdom. Our participation as resurrected people in the divine utopia, in the new heavens and new earth. It is in the salvation. Okay, this this idea, it winds up growing up or maturing is in the salvation. And that, that process that began with our birth... That's where it leads. It's, you see the same concept in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, where there he talks about this idea that growing in the ethical manifestations of faith, you know, add to, add to this, add to this, add to this, growing in the ethical manifestations of faith assures that we will never stumble from the path that we're on. See, a path that leads where? A path that leads to glory. Or as he says, an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll never stumble from the path that leads there, that culminates there, because as we are growing in the ethical manifestations of faith, as we are becoming more and more Christ-like, we are guarded from stumbling. If we stop, if we cease to grow, we become more vulnerable to the enemy. Okay, when we stagnate, when we stop growing, we stop caring about growing in Christ, growing in a knowledge. What is he telling me? What is the word teaching me? When we just stop and say, look, how many times you heard people, oh, I read the Bible. Oh, you did, did you? You read the Bible. Oh, you know, a lot of other people read the Bible, too. In fact, libraries are full of their reflections on that reading. So do you think they just kind of a once through in the NIV? That's it. You know, so now I don't have to mess with it anymore. You see, it's like if you stagnate, you are vulnerable. And I think that's what Second Peter says. And I think it's the same idea that you see here, that this growth through the word of God is in the salvation, that it culminates in our experience of eschatological salvation that he's talked about. This drive for longing to grow spiritually, it flows from their having experienced through their new birth in Christ. The Lord's goodness and kindness. He says, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Who can't amen that? Who has become a Christian? Who, having been delivered from darkness and hopelessness, meaninglessness, purposelessness, condemnation, delivered into the kingdom of the glory of God. Who can't say that you've tasted that the Lord is good? Okay, he tells them that's the motivation for this. You've tasted that the Lord is good. All right, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. He says, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. The honor, therefore, is for you who believe. But to unbelievers, the stone which the builders rejected, this one has become the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling 
and a rock of offense. They stumble by being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, in order that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. See, Jesus is here. He's called a living stone. He is a living person. He's no longer dead because he's been raised from the dead. He's a living person who is the who who in the spiritual or new temple. That is the church. You see, in, for instance, first Corinthians, chapter three, verse 16. He's a living person who in this spiritual new temple that is the church functions analogously to a cornerstone in a physical building. Okay, he's the living stone. Well, he's living And he functions in this spiritual temple, the church, this new temple that God is building. He functions analogously to a cornerstone in a physical building. You can see the same imagery in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. You see, in ancient times, a cornerstone just wasn't a decorative thing. You didn't build something, have it all constructed, and you slap this stone in there that says dedicated in 2010. That wasn't what that wasn't what it was. It was the it was the first stone laid. And see, it set the line or the standard by which the walls of the temple were constructed. So Christ in the new temple, the spiritual temple that is the church, functions analogously to a cornerstone in a physical temple because he is the standard. You see, he is the standard. So he refers here. He says that Jesus is a living stone. And then he tells them that as they convert to Christ. They are what? They are incorporated into the new temple that God is building. We are incorporated into the church. Peter Davids in his commentary in the New International Commentary on the New Testament, he says that temple imagery is intended is clear. It's clear from the usual use of the building image in the New Testament. Cites a number of texts, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 1 Timothy, Ephesians 2, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 10. He says that the temple image, that that temple imagery is intended is clear from the usual use of the building image in the New Testament from the house language in first Peter 417 that uses the Septuagint's language for the temple and from the easy shift to priesthood and sacrifice in context. So he speaks of a house, but he's speaking of the temple and he's speaking of the new temple, the new spiritual temple that God is building in the church. And these people are being added to it. They are brought into it. They are added to it in their conversion. And their incorporation into the new temple through faith in Christ is with their purpose, the purpose of their being a holy priesthood. This is, their incorporation into this is with the purpose of their being a holy priesthood that offers to God spiritual sacrifices rather than the physical sacrifices of the Jewish priesthood under the old covenant. So we have been brought into, you see how he shifts here. We are the temple, we are the stones in there, but we also are what? We are a holy priesthood in this temple. You see, and what are we doing? We are called to be this holy priesthood that we might offer spiritual sacrifices rather than these physical sacrifices that were typical in in Jewish religion under the old covenant. Now, these spiritual sacrifices, he says, what are they acceptable to God? What? Through Jesus Christ. You see, it is through Jesus Christ that we become proper vehicles of offerings to God. We have been made holy, set apart, just as you had priests, what? Priests had to be set apart, sanctified, designated, so that they may bring offerings to God. Those in Christ have been set apart, sanctified, cleansed, made holy. That we can bring offerings to God that are acceptable to him. So that is what we are. We are a priesthood that has been prepared, equipped, given by God the blessing of offering things to him that are acceptable to him. Now, that doesn't mean that he despises all that that non-Christians do. I'm aware of Cornelius, that his prayers and alms, they came up as a remembrance. But there is a sense of acceptance by God that only is through Jesus Christ. You see, it's not one of these things. All religions are the same. I don't care if you go this route or that route. We could get to this same point in a number of different ways. 
But he's saying, listen, it is through Christ. It is through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sorry if that offends our culture, our pluralistic society that says you can't say that. Oh, but I can. You see, I can. And I will say it until they do something to me. Because it's the truth. And it's not helping anybody by sitting here and going, okay, no, that's right. Jesus isn't special. Anything you want to do. They all, what's happening to the person? You've denied that person the truth that can save them. All right, now, what's that about? What would we call that? We would say, you didn't really love that person. You didn't really love that person. You were, because why? You didn't want him to think poorly of you. Well, love will allow the person to think poorly of them to bless the person, right? Yeah, that's right. So I think that's, that's an important thing, a point that he makes. Now, the nature of the spiritual sacrifices, the nature of the spiritual sacrifices Peter has in mind, they're indicated in verse 9. See, they're indicated there where he says that the purpose of there being a royal priesthood, he brings the priesthood back up, is to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, there are many people. Uh, scholars, many people who, who understand this as being that the purpose is that we are to be a priesthood that we are to proclaim into the world, that we are to be evangelistic. We are to proclaim to the world God's uh, praises of him who called you. I, I don't think that's right. OK, I'm not inspired. I'm just a sinner who grunts around and tries to understand. I don't think that's right. Many people do. I could be wrong. OK, but what I think is, is that he is talking about. The praises that we offer to God in worship. Let me read to you from J. Ramsey Michael's commentary. He quotes in part here another New Testament scholar, a guy named David Balch. But he says, in context where ex angelo, that's the word proclaim used here. It's a rare word in the New Testament. He says, in context where ex angelo refers to proclaiming the praises, deeds, righteousness, or works of God, the proclaiming always is to God in worship. Okay, and you see all these these uh, uh, texts that he cites in Psalms and Sirach and some other places, Philo. The bracketed uh, verses, they're the, that's the English versification. The ones that aren't in brackets are from the Septuagint. Okay, he continues and he says, whatever else they may imply, the spiritual sacrifices are, first of all, the praise of God by his people. You see, this is similar to Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15 says, through him, then let us always offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips praising his name. And as William Lane says in his commentary on Hebrews, he says, the writer of Hebrews draws upon a tradition of of a song of praise, which the community offers to God. Let me read to you a a two slide quote here from Edmund Clowney in his commentary on first Peter. He says, Peter says that we have been brought from darkness to light and made a priesthood so that we may show forth God's praises. This spiritual worship has no earthly altar or ark. It has transcended the elaborate ceremonials of Old Testament worship. It is vain to imitate pageantry, to imitate in pageantry the ceremonies that ended when the veil of the temple was torn in two. Yet worship remains the central calling, not only of the Christian, but of the Christian church. It finds its burning focus in lifting the name of God in adoration. This function of the priesthood cannot be delegated. God's praises must rise from the lips of all his people assembled before his face and joining with the festival assembly of the saints and angels. Nothing can be put above worship. We adore God not to gain his favor, but because adoration is our response to his grace. We are, to be sure, uniquely blessed through worship. And as God's worshipers, we seek his blessing. But the core of our worship is not receiving, but giving. Peter reminds us that, that, in, that the inestimable privilege of entering the presence of the Lord contains a yet greater privilege to lift his name and praise. If the singing and speaking forth of the praises of God are viewed as preliminaries to the sermon, the meaning of worship has been lost. You see, I fear sometimes we think that, you know, we're here and what we're doing, it's just the prelude to the sermon. I'm I'm a big believer in the power of speaking the word of God, because I think the sermon is a critical part of our interaction with God, because through it, God speaks to us and we submit to his word that is presented to us. So I don't downplay preaching at all. 
But I want us to see that this is not some just preliminary thing to get out of the way. You see, it is a very important, a very significant thing that is going on. You know, we've worried so much, in my judgment, we've worried so much about reducing Christianity to nothing more than our gatherings for worship. You know, that's been, oh, we can't do that. We can't, we can't think that there's anything special about that. We've worried, look, we cannot reduce Christianity simply to our gatherings of worship. We've worried so much about that that I fear we've unintentionally diminished the significance of the gathering. I think that's been an unintended consequence of our fear. Listen, uh oh, you're going to have people who think that all Christianity is is coming together. Then they'll live like complete toads during the week, but they'll feel good because they'll come here on Sunday. We can't have that. So our approach is, don't let them think there's anything special about this. It's all the same. And I think the unintended consequence of that is that we have diminished the significance of our gathering. Look, intimate communion with God is available for saints at all times and in all places. I understand that. But it seems that an even more intense experience of God's presence is available when we gather together to worship. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus said, Where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. What is that about? I can can pray under a tree. I can be by myself. Wait. Two or three come together. There am I with them. Okay, and and recall that in 1 Corinthians 5, 4, Paul refers to the power of the Lord Jesus present, what? When they are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord Jesus present when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus. Recall in 1 Corinthians 11, 10, Paul makes a passing reference to angels as present, or at least watching over their worship gathering. You see, there's something about the community of people. When God called Israel out from Egypt, He said, they're going to, so they'll serve me on this mountain. This serving is tied up with cultic service. Worship, sacrifice. Why does God care about that? Is He going to have an ego problem? Don't even say such things. Okay? Don't even say such things. God deserves all the praise and adoration from every atom, every quark in this place. Okay, so don't don't even don't say that. But he's called them out here. And I think we would be we'll be blessed richly. Richly, if we can get a sense of God's distinct presence in our corporate worship. And you know what I think is behind a lot of the uh, discontent with worship? I think a lot of what's behind the discontent is a lack of an appreciation of what is going on. We have a worldly view that it's just a gathering of people like the Rotary Club. Can we get on with it? When is the next speaker? We don't get it. Okay? I want to read to you. Uh, this, I think, is five slides. I know that's long. But it's from a guy named Larry Hurtado. He's an internationally respected New Testament scholar. He's at the Univers- University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, his specialty is... The early church, particularly devotional practices. And it is in his book at the origins of Christian worship, the context and character of earliest Christian devotion. Listen to what he has to say about their attitude. He says, the author of Hebrews speaks of participation in the community of Christian believers in awesome terms. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Hebrews 12, 23 and 24. Given that Christians were taught to think of themselves collectively in such terms, it is understandable that their cultic gatherings... Their worship gatherings were seen as filled with meaning and significance as well. They did not have temple structures or the elaborate rituals familiar in the larger religious environment. But, perhaps indeed therefore, the gathered group was itself a living shrine and their praise and worship spiritual sacrifices pleasing to God. They did not have a priestly order. 
Instead, they saw themselves collectively as a priesthood, all of them thus specially sacred, and they're gathering a holy occasion. He says they experienced their assemblies as not merely human events, but as having a transcendent dimension. They sensed God as directly and really present in their meetings through his spirit. Indeed, even a gathering of two or three believers is graced with the presence of Christ, Matthew 18, 20, giving it efficacy in prayer and other actions. In 1 Corinthians eleven ten, the curious passing reference to the angels present in the worship assembly shows how familiar the idea was. Paul's Corinthian readers apparently needed no further explanation, though we could wish for one. As the holy ones, saints of God, believers saw their worship gatherings as attended by heavenly holy ones, angels, whose presence signified the heavenly significance of their humble house church assemblies. It is this sense that Christian collective worship participates in the heavenly cultus, That finds later expression in the traditional words of the liturgy. Wherefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we do laud and magnify your glorious name. Scholars have suggested similarities with the Qumran sect, who seem to have thought of their worship as likewise a participation in heavenly angelic cultus, and thus as blessed with the presence of angels. The point is that in their sense of their worship gatherings as an extension of and participation in the idealized worship of the heavenly host, and in their view of their gatherings as graced with God's holy angels, they express a vivid, transcendent significance pertaining to these occasions. That is what we need. If we had that, I don't think people would be complaining about, well, I don't like the way the pews are arranged. Right? Do you understand what we're doing when we come together? And we wouldn't have people not singing. Right? Nobody not singing. Why? Because we're in the presence of God and we are telling Him, extolling His glory. As a community of redeemed people all before Him. We're just praising Him. Nobody not singing. Okay, it's not about the beauty of your voice and the note. It is about your spirit expressing the thank you, holy one, glorious one. Right? And I think, see, that will help. But this is the sense. This is what I think is, is the key, is the transcendent dimension. Thanks for coming.